All right, I'm now gonna pass things over to our moderator, Jeff Hornstein, who's the executive director of the Economy League in Philadelphia. Great, thank you very much, Angela. So I'm Jeff Hornstein, I run an 112 year old uh, think and do tank called the Economy League of Greater Philadelphia. We have done, we, we have, uh, I'm thrilled to be here in particular because we have a great partnership with the Science Center with Tiffany and Tracy and the whole staff. It's an amazing place. If you've never been here, I encourage you to visit and check it out. Um, but we have been doing a lot of work around um, the economic, economic impact of the pandemic, particularly around racial equity. And so I was very intrigued by the topic of this conversation to talk about technology and inequity, because a lot of times technology um, breeds inequity. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk a bit about that. But first I wanna give um, our two esteemed panelists a minute to introduce themselves. So Kwame, since you're uh, all the way across the country, why don't you, you start? Tell us well, a little bit about yourself. Greetings from Los Angeles. I'm fortunate enough to be the founder and executive director of MedTech Color, a nonprofit to advance the representation of persons of color in the medical device industry. And that's an all volunteer role. Uh, professionally, I serve as a venture partner at Waymaker 360 Health, which is an early stage uh, venture capital firm, which invests in medical devices, digital health technologies and diagnostic solutions. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a native Philadelphian, went to church about three blocks at 38th and Hamilton and graduated from George Washington Carver High School for Engineering and Science. So I hope that's enough credibility for me to be on this panel. I, I think I think you passed the test. And Sansini Craig, she got here from all the way from South Philadelphia. So for, from South California, Southern California to South Philly. So I'm Sansini Craig. I'm a pediatrician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I am a clinical informaticist and uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the Perman School of Medicine. And I did come from clinic. Um, I am actually even further south. I'm from Southeast Asia. I'm uh, half Thai, half United States um, citizen, so I buy citizenship. And I came to the States uh, when I was 19 and to Philadelphia only three years ago. So that's my roots to Philadelphia. Welcome. And didn't you also go to medical school or do a residency or something in Israel? I did. I'm a little bit of a nomad. So I did medical school in Israel for four years. Um, it's a program for people interested in global health, and that's been my passion um, ever since. Very cool. All right. So I'm going to start off with a sort of a 15,000 foot question, right? Um, the pandemic really has shown a clear light on all the inequities. I mean, those of us who've been working in this space, I was a union organizer for 10 years before I got into think tank work. And, you know, inequity is just baked into our society in so many ways. And, and the pandemic really, I think, if there's any salutary effect of the, of the pandemic, it's that so many more people's eyes have been opened to uh, structural inequality throughout our society. And of course, healthcare has been at the center of the pandemic for obvious reasons. Can you discuss, um, and I'll start with you, Sansini, what, what are some of the biggest health equity challenges um, from your point of view, and then if you want to flag a couple opportunities too, but let's start with some challenges. So I think um, we were not prepared for uh, video visit telehealth in the pandemic uh, for our kind of more, what I'm going to use the term priority patient populations, which is an AHRQ, um, Agency for Health uh, Research and Quality, um, uh, terminology for those kind of marginalized patient populations, families and patients who speak a language other than English, um, who are uh, publicly insured, who live in high social vulnerability uh, index areas. And we definitely were not prepared um, to try to think about how to get an interpreter onto a video visit. So I think that the pandemic just really shone a light on all of the fact that our technology is really designed for English speakers um, and not um, other speakers. But more importantly, I think that the biggest challenges for health disparities are really the social disparities. As we all know, um, healthcare disparities are social disparities, and it really is those conditions that we live, born and breathe and die in that are the biggest issues um, for health equity today. Kwame, what about from and your point of view? From my point of view, those challenges persist because uh, people making healthcare solutions are not properly incentivized to focus on underrepresented communities that suffer. So one example in California was 
we could not fully reopen in Los Angeles until there was a certain amount of testing and vaccination deployed to underrepresented pockets of LA, poor people. And I think that type of incentivizing, you could make the case that's a disincentive, but those types of targets don't exist rampantly in the private sector and public sector such that it is top of mind, people won't get their bonus, they won't be able to put food on the table if they don't focus on this issue. And, and I think that's that's kind of the bottom line. Interesting, so we've got one solution, one, one set of problems around the structure of incentives for, um, for promote, promotion of equity and another set of challenges around kind of social determinants. Um, but also I think you pointed to some interesting things. I have a good friend named Jean Wang and it's a little commercial for her, but she owns a uh, translating service called Quantum. She's a Chinese uh, uh, immigrant, her husband's from Vietnam. They own a translating service. It's literally in Jefferson's backyard. And you know they've seen their business kind of dry up during the pandemic because they couldn't get in the hospitals. And they lost a lot of it to these multinational kind of uh, tele tele interpreter services, which I, I don't know what your views on that, but it seems to me that it's got to be a lot less effective than an in-person translator. Yeah, um, the definitely in-person is preferred over video for sure. Um, but in situations like the pandemic where you can only do video or audio telehealth, um, audio only telehealth, then if you don't have an interpreter, you don't have healthcare that you're providing um, to that particular patient population. Um, and I think that one of the problems we had was figuring out how to technologically weave in our interpreters, um, whether it was through externally contracted vendors or in-house interpreters. Um, and there were two different processes and workflows we had to figure out very quickly. Yeah, I mean, we're, I'm gonna come back to this because you, you know, in our prep call, you said something about using informatics to make change and we're gonna, we're gonna get back to that. Um, can you, can either or both of you talk about some of the opportunities you see coming out of the pandemic, sort of at a high level before we drill down a little further? Um, at a high level, I think as Sansini talked about, telemedicine can be deployed ideally to reach more people, more vulnerable populations. And there's a fair amount of public money still left that I could that I think could be targeted with a health equity lens. And it could be matched with private dollars. So in California, there's an organ, a statewide association, California Life Science Association. They're developing a health equity strategy. Oops, we froze. Hopefully he'll come back. The beauty of technology. <laughs> While we're waiting for him, do you want to take a shot at some opportunities that you sure. see? Sure. Um, oh, wait, I think he's back. Ahead, we, we missed, like, you said oh. California Life Sciences Association, and then you froze. Thank you. I'm, I'm unfrozen now. They are putting pressure on private companies to... Um, support this health equity strategy and develop solutions that can address more vulnerable populations by getting them involved early on in development of the products. Um, I think there are two opportunities. One, the pandemic uh, really highlighted uh, the need to really evaluate our interventions, whether we are creating disparities, maintaining disparities, widening disparities, which are not of the, none of the scenarios that we want. We want to close disparities. And so out of the pandemic, there have been many um, equity impact assessment tools that have been developed, have been developed for a long time, but have kind of come to the forefront. Seattle Children's created one that I think is a really good one to think about any kind of policy program or intervention you're developing. Are you widening disparities? Are you perpetuating disparities? Are you actually maintaining disparities? So I think that the tools and the awareness out of the pandemic is an opportunity to use these tools. But number two, I think um, over and over again in my residency training, we were taught this, we knew this, 80% of health outcomes is not related to anything that we do in healthcare. Healthcare is only 10 to 20% is a famous study 
of what we're actually doing. The rest of it is the circumstances that we live in. So I think one of the opportunities that's come out of this is all of us that have been in training that have heard this and know this, the literature shows us over and over again, is to say, what are we doing in healthcare to really improve patients' lives, make help people live healthier lives? And are we actually doing that? You know, we are, Don Bergerick is the famous um, uh, previous administrator of CMMS who created uh, crossing the quality wrote crossing the quality chasm and defined these domains of medicine equity being one of them and he wrote a phenomenal article which I would recommend the moral determinants of health and he said you know we um, all have to really just get together and say we're just repair shops hospitals and healthcare systems we're just repair shops when are we actually going to get around to doing something else about the rest of the social determinants of health so I think that's one of the opportunities I think that's great and you know Full, full disclosure, Children's Hospitals on my board and my board chair is actually a CHOP person. And I'll, I'll give a little commercial for CHOP too, because I think one of the things that's impressed me about Madeline Bell's leadership is the investment that CHOP is making in social determinants. I mean, Kaiser and others have made them started this trend years ago, but CHOP is, you know, healthier together pr program, renovating houses, the theory that it's cheaper to renovate someone's house and get the mold, the asthma causing mold out of the house than it is to continually treat patients in the ER for asthma attacks. So I think there's there's some things that that may be salutary about this. So Sansani, during our prep uh, session, you described your work as leveraging informatics to increase equity in the system. Uh, you just pointed to an example. Can you elaborate on, on how your, what your interventions are? Sure. Everybody always asks me, and my husband included, what do you actually do, clinical informatics? What does that mean? What do you actually do? So my bread and butter work that I do is I think about the Venn diagram of people, process, and technology. I work in the middle. How can we use technology to augment the people's work in the processes that they do to help people live healthier lives? And for the most part, it's very simply just process redesign. You know, you can create a very fancy tool, um, a very shiny new app, but if nobody actually use it because it doesn't fit in your workflow and it doesn't actually make any sense, no one's going to use it. So that's kind of where I come in as a physician. I can say, I'm never going to click this button because it doesn't really fit my workflow. Um, and so my patient's never going to really be healthier because of this great tool you built. So that's kind of where I see um, thinking about uh, the right place, the right person, the right time using a tool like uh, sending a fax message to early intervention to say, I screen this child for a developmental delay. I'm sending this off to you now. Please do something about it. Help reach out to this person. There's a lot of pieces in that puzzle that could go wrong, and the child can never reach across the finish line um, unless we really think about leveraging technology to really close these disparity gaps. So that's what I hope to do. So just continuing down that line a little bit. So there must have been massive process changes because of the pandemic. I mean, we all know this, like, couldn't walk into a hospital with a with a, another person if you're getting treated even to this day they still discourage you from i just had a procedure and they said oh you're coming alone right you don't need you're not having general anesthesia so we need we want you to come alone. so there's been all these process changes some of them just sort of emergency responses and kind of iterating in response to the pandemic have you noticed any or have you, have you identified some that need to stick that we need to I mean, what have we learned about process change from your point of view? Uh, yeah, I think talking specifically to digital health, um, our front desk staff were really the heroes in all this and helping people understand how to sign up for the patient portal so you could even do a video visit. So at our institution, uh, currently we have a um, video visit platform that's tethered to our patient portal. And there are upwards of 10 to 30% gaps between majority and minority groups of who has an activated patient portal, who actually goes and signs and uses that activation code, goes in, signs in, logs in, can find where to join the video visit and join is quite onerous. So our, our uh, patients, uh, the staff really were the heroes that said, have you logged in lately? Here's how to reset your password. Let me just help you figure out how to find your way to do this thing called a video visit. And I think out of that has come the processes by which we identify digital literacy um, requirements of our own app and development. And I, I really like to try to put the onus on us as opposed to on patients and say, what are we requiring of our patients to have? What digital literacy skill are we requiring with how complex we make these steps? And our, our patients and our staff have really said, oh, we really want to identify and help you do this thing called a patient portal in digital health. And I hope that that will stay, that process of where in the visit can we insert tech support? For, for digital health. And, and making it user experience friendly. 
It's interesting. I was at a meeting most of the day about procurement reform. I know completely different than this, but how complicated it, we make it for small businesses to interface with large institutional uh, procurement opportunities. And you know, everyone thinks about it from the perspective of the institution. Well, this is just what we need to teach them how to do this. We're like, no, you need to learn from them about what would be a sensible way to interact. And so it's got to go both ways and, and be iterative. And I think that's pretty pretty powerful. So Kwame, you described your work during our prep call as leveraging capital to increase equity. Can can you elaborate? Because I, you know, I, I I now know understand. I think what MedTech Color is. Can you uh, describe it to the, the lay audience here, like what you guys are trying to do and why you started with why medical devices? Where... Yeah, well, um, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, it's, an industry, it's an industry like others that has a fair amount of underrepresentation and has deep and broad impact. It's a multi-billion dollar industry affecting millions of lives every day. Um, so there's a potential to have real impact. That's the why. Uh, and better impact because of all the research that shows if you have more diverse teams, your outputs will be increased. The, the way we can leverage capital in MedTech Colors two ways. We have a pitch competition where we provide non-dilutive capital to early stage MedTech companies that are managed and controlled by African-Americans and uh, Latinx founders. And why that makes sense to us is they are more inclined to be developing solutions with underrepresented communities in mind. One of our winners is developing a device that will uh, reconstitute your fat to be injected to treat people with diabetic foot ulcers, as an example. There's a CHOP story. This person, uh, Dr. Patrick Hines, was not a part of MedTech Color, uh, but he developed a, a diagnostic for uh, titrating treatment of patients with sickle cell disease. And he's actively um, using that diagnostic at CHOP. So if we can invest in more leaders of color, we can increase the chance of producing solutions to reach more patients. And those are a couple examples. One last thing we're doing at Collaborative at Meta Color is yesterday we formally launched Collaborative Communities, which is a partnership with the FDA, American Medical Association, health uh, medtech manufacturers to provide tools and resources to help developers diversify clinical trials and diversify the inputs and in product development. So that as we talked about with digital health solutions, you can start with a broader set of users in mind so that the products can reach more people and, and get at health equity. So I'm the CEO of Medtronics. Why do I care about this? Yeah, <laughs> well, you care about it because you can improve your top line and bottom line. And the CEO of Johnson & Johnson gets this. We actually had a, um, our, one of our first events was a, a, a coffee with the CEO, the former CEO of Medtronic, Omar Ishrat. So we know that he gets it um, for those reasons. There's a financial clear um, benefit. And, and you can quantify that as a venture capital guy and make the clear ROI case and growing part of the population. Oh yeah, the, the, if you just Google terms like health equity, diversity and teams, you'll come up with peer reviewed research that's been put out by McKinsey and others. Um, and I don't wanna insult anyone's intelligence, but it's, it's Googleable. This has been table stakes and well understood for years now. It's just a matter of incentivize people to act, to act on it, in my humble opinion. I have one last story in terms of how this can play out. We uh, at uh, Waymaker 360 Health invested in a women's health company called Materna Medical that reduces childbirth delivery and damage to the pelvic floor. And one of the investors is a fund out of California called the Black VC Fund. And they asked this CEO who happens to be a Caucasian woman, how are you focused on helping black women during childbirth? So she had to rethink targets 
and was incentivized because she had a check waiting for her if she could rethink how her solution could reduce adverse events for Black women. And that's how capital can be focused to help underrepresented communities. Thanks for that. So are you seeing at, at CHOP these kinds of um, new technology solutions being applied in, you know, with an equity framework? Uh, I think so. Um, there's always going to be constraints. There's constraints that the vendors bring to us, the software companies. There's constraints um, financially. I think of things like remote patient monitoring tools, um, online web-based, not portal tied um, appointment scheduling, and texting, uh, bilateral, you know, two-way texting. Uh, we would, we really are aiming to provide multilingual texting. Uh, capabilities, but sometimes uh, the technology just doesn't even exist to really support Mandarin, for example, or the technology system we just have, are, none of the vendors will uh, allow us to uh, provide us the means by which we can bilaterally text in Mandarin to our families. Um, so I think that um, when we are thinking about digital health interventions, we are now looking to the future to say, uh, could these interventions be creating what's known as intervention generated inequalities, IGIs, which is a, a term that's well known. Um, and it's challenging when we say there just really isn't anything out there that we can use, then what do we do next? I think this is something that's a challenge still. Yeah, I mean, I think about um, the move in media towards text-based platforms um, because pretty much everybody has some text capacity, but I'd imagine from a healthcare point of view, so many lower income folks are changing their cell phone numbers and their plans get cut off and things like that. So I'm just thinking out loud here about like, what are the continuity strategies? How do you, you know, build those long-term relationships so you don't lose folks to technology? Yeah, I think uh, user-centered design, user-centered design, is, is, it goes back to um, relationships that we build with communities. You know, what does the community actually want and need to help to live a healthier life? Who are we to say that this is some, and I'm speaking from a global health standpoint too, where we don't go in and great white savior our way into neighborhoods and say, here's this new tool that we think you should have. You know, it's all about relationship building and capacity building to say, here's this great new tool. We think it can help you live a healthier life. What do you think and what do you actually need? And Philadelphia has a great community-based needs assessment report. Um, and you can even look at that to see what communities have said they need. And looking at our digital health tools, uh, who are you really benefiting? Uh, because that's where IGIs happen is when we disproportionately benefit already advantaged patient populations as opposed to the priority populations. And kind of easy way to think of that is centering the margins. What would it look like if we built health IT with the margin lines at the center of our design? I think that's really powerful. And uh, just a political footnote, right? The Affordable Care Act was upheld for a third time by the Supreme Court today. So the CBNA will still exist, which is, or CHNA will still exist, which is, which is, I mean, it's an incredibly rich document of information. If you've never read one, I highly recommend it. Um, so before we, you raised something about confidence and trust, which I want to really come back to towards the end of our conversation, because I think that's, we started up here and I want to really lateralize out and talk about how we rebuild trust in a system that a lot of people don't trust, right? Um, but Kwame, first I wanted to ask you, is MedTech Color a, a unicorn or are there other uh, allied kind of efforts going on across the industry and how are you guys working together? Yeah, so one of our inspirations uh, to form MedTech Color, and they have been a actually a financial supporter and moral supporter, is MedTech Women. MedTech Women started five years before us, and it is, in my estimation, the destination for leaders um, who want access to the best and brightest domain experts in the medical device industry. They put on an amazing annual conference where the speakers are not talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. They're speaking about their areas of expertise in the medical device industry. And we modeled that. So we've had several webinars in partnership with them. A member of MedTech Women sits on that collaborative communities that we talked about. And uh, we just believe that the whole industry is better when there's diversity through the lens of gender and race and, and other lenses. But those are the, that's our our biggest nonprofit partner is MedTech Women. 
Cool. I, I'm also thinking about like other related medical fields, right? Is, is there a movement? And, and again, this may be out of your wheelhouse, but is there a movement similar to this in pharma? Because that seems to me to be another huge yeah. place where, where um, community input and user-centered design would be cr critical. I believe the organization is called Women of Color in Pharma. And for me, the question is, in addition to that, is how are these nonprofits being supported? Are they getting you know, put in the budgets of large corporates so that they have sustainability over the long term, such that if the George Floyd incidents of the world fade away, these nonprofits can stand the test of time. But I do think that there's increased interest in health equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion and supporting nonprofits like Women of Color and Pharma, MedTech Women, MedTech Color. Interesting. Um, how, how large a market is the, the med tech industry? I'm embarrassed, Tiffany, please don't hit me. I should notice off the top of my head. It's, 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 well, it's, it must be over a hundred billion dollar market. It, it's, it's deceptively large. It's not on par with pharma, but it's a major healthcare subsector. And, and Tiff, don't hit me because I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I should. <laughs> 180 billion, says, says Tracy Brawla. And, and so <laughs> has there been any basic research about what the participation rate is on people of color in this, in this space? Yes. So we, it's funny you say that. So the large industry trade association called Avamed has a health equity strategy and it's under the nomenclature of Avamed Advance. And they've shared some initial data. The bottom line is um, we fall behind um, the broad, just private sector industry in terms of representation of people of color at all levels, significantly for African-Americans, significantly in commercial roles. Um, so there's work to do. And, and it's, it's the reason why we're around. Awesome. Um, so Stanson, you started um, down the, the trust and confidence road, and, and I really want to spend a little time on that before we take some questions from the, from the audience. It seems to me that um, the pandemic and the resurgent movement for racial equity have um, really highlighted a lack of confidence and trust in basic institutions, even, you know, healthcare um, being exposed as inequitable, um, you know, access to COVID vaccines. We can, there's a whole list of things. So wh what can we do to rebuild this trust? I know it's a little question. Yeah, I mean, um, I take a, you know, a quality improvement approach to a lot of my work. What's the root problem? What are the, what are the different driver diagrams? What are the, root, what are the different uh, causes of this? And it's, as one might expect, multi, multimodal. Um, and um, I think that one one thing to just acknowledge right away is with humility to say, you're right. You know, when it comes to, I can even think of particularly trust of the patient portal. What are you doing with my data? Uh, you know, what am I signing up for? It's not very transparent. Um, there is a real reason, you know, when we think about uh, pediatric patients and caregivers, it's actually quite difficult to protect and confidentially protect data that belongs to one caregiver protected from the other caregiver protect adolescent confidentiality data. So the root cause of some of this, if there is uh, distrust and, and, and uh, lack of confidence, it can be very real. So we need to address what is the problem and what are the root causes. And in that, it's you're not talking to yourself. You're not talking to a mirror. You're talking to a community, to a group of people, and you're asking this in a community-engaged way. Um, and then the other question to ask is, is it really distrust and lack of confidence or is it access? You know, um, sometimes there may be a sense of, uh, you know, disappointment in the institutions and say, well, I don't want the vaccine, but is it really that or is it I just can't get it and I want it and we've, no one's ever asked me. So I think that those are two different, um, uh, two different problems for the same, uh, two different causes for the same root problem. And the answer lies in just ask, talking, you know, having conversation. I'm going to push a little bit on this. So what about relationship building? 
And I mean, there was a time, maybe it's totally mythical, you know, that our parents' generation talks about. Like, I used to know my family doctor and I used to go to my family doctor and like people had a, a, a much more one-to-one -one relationship. I mean, I've had the same doctor for 20 years, but that's my own, my own privilege, right? I don't, I've had good health insurance and been able to maintain a relationship. How do we build those relationships? Is there a technology aspect to that too? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, again, I think that the answer doesn't lie in us. That's the problem. If we're asking ourselves, how do we do this? You know, we're asking ourselves, it's one-sided. We can't answer that. You know, we as a healthcare institution or those of us who are healing in the healing profession have lived and breathed and swam in these baked in waters for a long time. How can we possibly answer that? Um, and so I think from a technological side, thinking about, you know, oh, let's quickly put in messaging into the portal. You, now you can message me and you can ask me anything. That's going to fix our relationship. Now you'll trust me, right? And so then we have to ask families, you know, our patients, I'm a pediatrician, so I say families, um, you know, what is it, uh, how, how would you feel more supported? How can I help you live a healthier life? Is it messaging? Here, let me show you what I think this could do. What do you think? Um, you can t send me a message if you need a letter for school. But by the way, I won't see it for three days because that's how busy I am. So you treat it like email, you know? So I think the building up of uh, trust um, using technology has to definitely be um, a, a, a communal activity. It, we just can't answer that questions ourselves. Um, we created the distress. We can't fix it ourselves. We got to re-engage with the community. Community-based organizations are a great start. I think that's a great answer. Um, so I think about, you know, the relationship between the two of you, right? Your fields. I mean, you're, you're uh, in some ways a consumer of the products that, or a user of the products that Kwame is helping to fund. And, um, you know, I, I imagine your patients and families really have, don't give much thought to where the device is coming from and how it's made and how it's, who's paying for it. And uh, the, is, is it, Creating, is it creating wealth for people of color or, or majority populations? I don't know where I'm going with this actually, but um, I, I think there's, a, you know, what's the Venn diagram? I've been thinking about this for a bit. Like what's the Venn diagram between, because I, I love that term and you brought it up earlier. Like, What's the Venn diagram between informatics as an agent of change and capital as an agent of change? And I don't know who wants to take that first or I, I, a good I have some thoughts that, and maybe me and Sansani can riff a little bit. So I've, I've been thinking a lot about this company called Kintsugi, K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I. It is a software as a medical device solution that listens to your voice to help screen for depression. And I know that founder who happens to be Asian American is committed to develop, it's AI powered. And I know they're, and they're in the United Health Group Accelerator. I know she's committed to developing it with data from a broad range of patients and engaging with clinicians to build a product that can serve many. And in my world, that's something that if more investors demand it, I think the, the long-term implications is you get away from this statistic that says black men are consistently not given pain medication, I believe it is, because they're, they're, they're not, they're believed to be stronger than what they actually are, right? Like that's a classic, I believe, research that shows black men aren't treated properly because their pain, their physical pain literally isn't acknowledged. So if we build these solutions in partnership with clinicians, with a broad data set that's representative of the population, I think we can get at this long-term. Do you have a response to that like as a clinician? I like what you said, Kwame, about um, create, driving, creating the, the need, the ask. You know, if enough people ask for this, if enough investors ask for this, the demand will be there. And so the supply will be there. I think um, one 
I think I think there's infinite hope. Dr. Martin Luther King talked about there has to be infinite hope. I think there's infinite hope if we realize that when the least of us are healthy, we all benefit financially, economically, the whole country benefits. And so if we can, if we can not maintain the status quo, not modify the status quo, but if we can really truly say healthcare and having a healthy life is a universal privilege, it's a universal right of everyone, um, you know, and we can think about these uh, capital um, uh, organizations or devices that are being developed in, and what they are doing is really bringing up everybody who's being left behind and helping them live healthier lives. And if the demand is there for that, um, I think that there could be hope. I think that the one thing that um, I'm concerned about is whenever, uh, you know, we we basically say we're just going to keep tweaking what we already have and that will be good enough on the average. Everybody will live healthier lives. And I think that will unfortunately perpetuate or, or worsen disparities. We really just have to re completely rethink, as I said, that 80% of social determinants of health. What of our devices are really helping those circumstances that people are living in to have healthier lives? Are we developing anything like that? Um, and if not, why not? I think if we could, and if the demand is there, uh, we as a country will be um, healthier for it. The optimist, I love it. Um, do we have any questions in the chat, Angela? Um, there are none right now, but please feel free to type any questions in the chat for the panelists. Audience? Hold on one second, George. I just want to make sure they can hear you on Zoom. I've got a question about the digital divide. You mentioned people being able to use the technology. What if you... Again, I'm ignorant, but what if you are homeless, don't have a device at all? How is any of this any use to you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the digital divide is a term that arose in, in the early 19, um, late early 1990s, or turn of the century. And initially it was meant to talk binary, those who have internet and a computer device and those who don't. Over the years, that term has really evolved. We now know that it's really a spectrum. Um, it's not just those who have and have not. And even more recently, we start to think about the different levels of digital divides from a user-centered standpoint, from an efficacy standpoint, who, even if you had no barriers at all in all the world, could you really benefit from the tool as it is designed in the same way as somebody else? Could you really have a healthier life? And so when we uh, think about that, we think about, well, what is so great about technology? What is it about it that could help us live? And how do you define technology? Is it as simple as a very uh, complex, but um, uh, texting, right? Using low tech, simple, elegant solutions um, to really help somebody. Um, so getting to your homeless example, you know, if you don't have a device and you don't have internet, you definitely are on that kind of binary divide. So then we think about, well, why is that the case? And then there's a lot of work being done in the city right now to evaluate access to internet um, and um, devices. So definitely, I think that that is an important work that needs to happen. We need to say, who among us really and truly doesn't have internet, really and truly doesn't have devices? And why is that? Why don't we have broadband as a universal access to everybody? But beyond that, and that's kind of like the last couple of decades, we've known this for a while, we should have fixed this problem by now. Everybody ought to have internet, broadband access as a, as a universal right and a device. Um, beyond that, even if we all those barriers are brought down, what are we doing right now today to which is say, yeah, actually, we're gonna close the door. You're not gonna be able to walk through this door and use these tools. So it's both. People need internet and devices. They will always need internet devices. We need to make sure that that is in hand. At the same time, we cannot um, uh, you know, realize that we've grown past just the digital divide. Think about the different levels and how that's evolved. Um, so all of those, that work is important as well, too. Kwame, have anything to add to that? Yeah, the only thing I will add is I think about this organization. It's a nonprofit called Equalize Health. Um, it used to be called DRAV. They develop medical devices for emerging um, uh, developing countries, India, certain countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and they develop them with the user in mind and they tend to be minimalist solutions. But I don't see analogous healthcare organizations 
with robust funding to try and meet people in remote areas, to develop solutions to meet people in remote areas. I think there's millions of people in, in, in the unhoused um, that could benefit from potentially simpler solutions, assuming you can get them into a healthcare setting, some, some things you just can't deploy on the side of the street. But we need nonprofits with that particular focus. And the nonprofits that I know of are focused for outside the United States. So what if we could turn it inside and develop those solutions for that population? It's, it's interesting. I was at a Wharton Social Impact Conference years ago. It was one of the first ones. And, um, you know, the students had the, it was a pitch competition. These students had amazing ideas that all applied to, you know, West Africa and, and and other places very far away. And at one point I just raised my hand. I was like, has anybody actually looked out the window here? <laughs> like all these great solutions, but no one's developing them here. Right. I mean, most U S cities are kind of echoes of third world countries in some ways. Right. Or what we used to call third world countries. Right. There's like a huge disparity between, between the top and the and the rest of the population is interesting is very concrete has anybody noticed the kiosks around center city that offer broadband access right that was a huge fight i when, when you know my my uh, hobby is being a civic leader some uh, part of the philadelphia crosstown coalition and all the civic association we had a huge fight over those things and they were trying the center city residents association were trying to block those kiosks and you know, those of us who care about equity, we're like, you know, this is going to be a resource for the, un I like the way you use it, on the unhoused, right? And, and you see it, you walk down the street every day, I see someone charging a cell phone, I see someone using the internet access, you know, be great if we had the societal wherewithal to get folks into, into housing and off the streets. Um, but everyone should have a phone and we've got these kiosks, they should be everywhere. Right, at least that would be part of a solution. Yeah, I think thinking outside the box, Kwame, to your point of, um, you know, this could look really different. This is where innovation can really come into play. You know, for your person who's experiencing homelessness, you know, if they uh, had no barriers, so they had the phone, they had the device, uh, what is their preference? You know, I think. Um, when does a disparity become a difference when you have no choice anymore? Mm -hmm. um, it's been written in a lot of literature. So does that person have a choice in using the technology or do they not see any value at all because of the circumstances which they've lived and grown and, and born in? Um, and does the tool actually offer them any value? I think one of the things that we saw in the pandemic was because we had our, our video visits tethered to our portal, people suddenly saw the value in the portal where there really wasn't anything there to help you live a healthier life before maybe, maybe there was, but we didn't really you know, make it easy for, for folks to access it. And so now suddenly there's, there's value and people are saying, okay, you know, uh, I wanna participate in this. So to your person experiencing homelessness, what would that look like uh, on a device? What would be on there? How would it be used? How would that person say this, this thing is what I need and what I want? Um, you know, whether that's finding um, uh, uh, food or housing or security or connection and, you know, whether um, it's addressing loneliness, um, what does that, what would that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all talking about what does it look to design, I think you put it really well before, design from the margins, right, instead of from the sort of normative privileged perspective, which is what we've mostly done throughout human history. And, Other and there's a... Real quick, and there's a, it's not a nuance, uh, from an investment standpoint for a company looking to raise venture capital, the story typically is we're focused on this particular population that may be a population in the margins, but our next market is going to be a big, bigger, broader population, which is a billion dollar market. And that's why you should invest in us. And that is a sellable story. So if there are you know, people in the audience thinking that this is a niche problem or who's going to fund this or what are the economics of it? There is a story you can tell and there is a business to be had, a for-profit business that starts with vulnerable populations and expands to larger markets. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about universal design, right? Like, why do we build a ramp and stairs when we can just build the ramp, right? Serves everybody. Um, 
don't know if that's a good analogy, but you know, we, we've often thought about these things as add-ons instead of starting from the perspective of the vulnerable, which is going to capture the bigger audience too. It's actually more work if you build the sidewalk and you go back down and break down all those little edges and build the ramp then afterwards than if you just built the ramp to begin with at the very beginning, which I think is one of the arguments of, you know, we'll build it first for this population and then afterwards we'll translate it. And that sometimes actually is more effort. And in the end, the... Um, you know, the, you'll spend more money, you'll spend more of your team's effort doing it that way, retrofitting health equity than just doing it from the beginning. Might be a little bit slower, but if we invest the time and the effort to really build up our teams to create accessible technology from the beginning, in the end, it actually will be uh, faster and cheaper and more efficient and all the right words for an our institution. All the right words for our venture capital folks. Other questions from the audience? Well, we are close to at time. Should we, um, I want to thank Kwame. Well, ask you if you have any last words and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Last word, Kwame. Well, I, I just think, uh, well, I love the way Sansani said it. Uh, there's nothing but upside and opportunity. And there are models also where I think the state can play a role. Um, in California, we've seen pools of money to help um, venture capitalists invest in particular sectors. And there's nothing to say that pools of money, sometimes it's a debt instrument, could be used to invest in a healthcare sector like medtech and uh, have a health equity focus to it as well. So I just, I know the previous conversation was um, kind of a, the role of the state. And I do think states can play an interesting role in this as well. And I'll leave it at that. States meaning the boxes that are drawn on the map in the United States, or yes. government more generally. <laughs> yes, indeed. Any closing words, Sansi? Um, No, thank you so much for the privilege. And uh, I guess I ought to just say that all opinions my own and don't represent shop, yeah. just to be safe. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you both. This has been really interesting. I've learned a lot by interacting with you guys over the past week or so since we've started collaborating on this mm -hmm. panel. And um, thank you for that. That was a great equity question, by the way. George, thank you for bringing that up. All right. Have a great, what a great discussion. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you so much, Sansani and Kwame. And thanks everyone for coming tonight.